Hey everybody, welcome back uh, to the webinar, uh, part two. We're so glad that all of you have joined us again. Um, I'm Rebecca Shipman. I am the president of Reservoir Data Systems. I'm gonna try to share my screen with everybody. Um, so I, I was actually a little bit nervous about presenting because I think we've had over 600 and some odd people register for this event. Uh, so I had a little bit of anxiety, but then I realized that there's a high probability that most of you are probably still in your pajamas. So that helped with the anxiety. And um, that also tells me that there's just a lot of engagement in the industry with this topic. So super excited that all of you are here. Um, I am really excited about the content that our panelists are going to be sharing with you today. I 100% believe that everyone is going to walk away with some significant value. So just hang on to your pants. It's gonna be a great, webinar. Um, some of the reasons why we wanted to put this webinar to begin with, uh, when Reservoir Data and Saga had a conversation a couple weeks ago, you know, we just saw a lot of opportunity in our industry to really take advantage of these shut-ins and acquire and analyze data. From the get-go, we've been in business probably about 16 years, and our mission um, is to empower our industry, to empower our clients, to make better decisions by providing them with insightful data. And that's still our mission to this day. And what a great opportunity um, for us as an industry to take advantage of um, the shut-in data. A little bit about us. Like I said, we've been in business for about 16 years and we are a full service data acquisition to our industry. And we have a lot of experience acquiring um, quality pressure data to be used for analysis. We're full service operation. We operate all the major basins and we are really known for our customer service. With our experience, uh, we have learned over the years some um, and have observed some of those common mishaps and issues uh, from acquiring data. So what we did is we turned that into eight best practices for acquiring data for analysis. We made that video and posted it on our LinkedIn website our company website on LinkedIn. Uh, so you can go visit that. I uh, hope it brings you some value. And I'm looking forward to carrying on the conversation with you to help you with any data acquisition needs you have. This is the best way for you to reach out to us. We'd love to connect. Um, as we're going through this webinar, I just want to remind everybody, I know it's tough times in our industry. And uh, we just need to keep calm and get data. Uh, we want to partner with you if, if the cost of data acquisition is going to be the reason why you are not utilizing these very valuable solutions that our panelists are going to share with you today. I hope you reach out. As an industry, we really need to come together right now and we want to partner with you. So, um, and that's what we're here to do. I want to just reiterate how valuable the content our panelists are going to provide you. I'm so proud of them um, for what they're willing to share uh, because they also ha have a passion in our industry to see it get better and better. So I'm proud of them. I'm very thankful to Trent because he saw a need in our industry for the content that we're, um, that these folks are sharing with you and he answered the call to come moderate. And I am beyond proud of the Reservoir Data Systems team and the Saga Wisdom team for working hard and working quickly to put this webinar on for you guys. So thanks again for joining and without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to my friend, Trent Jacobs. Hey, thanks, Rebecca. That was a very heartfelt uh, introduction, so I really appreciate it. I'm going to share my screen now really quickly. Okay, um, so uh, unfortunately, we didn't make a, uh, uh, an agenda here without my, uh, without my mugshot on it, um, but uh, hopefully everybody can see this. So this is just the, uh, a, a real quick overview of the agenda um, that we're going to uh, have today. So like Rebecca said, we're going to have some really, really strong uh, presentations. I have the feeling that that there's going to be, uh, when we all start going back to conferences, this is going to be a major topic at uh, unconventional uh, SBE events, and we're going to have entire technical sessions dedicated to this topic. So for everybody listening in and watching right now, you're getting a, a sneak peek at, at, at some of that. Um, so you won't have to wait um, for the, the conference cycle to come around. Let me switch to uh, this slide real quick. Uh, for everybody watching, when you're done with this, um, just one takeaway and plug for JPT, go to our website right now on the homepage is an article that's written by uh, CEO of Saga Wisdom, uh, David, uh, 
uh, Anderson, and uh, sorry, and uh, he is uh, going to uh, explain to you some of the fundamentals here. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, and we are going to introduce um, our, our first speaker, who is Nathan McMahon of uh, ConocoPhillips. He's a staff reservoir engineer there, and he's going to talk to us about operational considerations and restart criteria. And before we transition to Nathan, we're just going to start with a quick polling question for the audience oh, yes. um, to get a little bit of feedback on where you are at in your shut-in process. Uh, so that's now available to you. We'll let that uh, get the answers come in. And Nathan, you may as well start talking now while the, uh, while the answers come in. Yeah, good. Good morning, everyone. Appreciate the opportunity to come talk again and follow up and um, just really wanted to come today and talk a little bit from my experience and things I've seen that could be good to put out here, um, not get into the details of some of the stuff that that John and others will talk to as, as SMEs around some of these other topics. But, you know, right now, all of us are kind of sitting here, even wondering our day to day lives, how things are going to get back to normal as we try to open up. So if we think about that with our wells, if you're shutting in wells, you essentially put them in quarantine as well. And everyone's highly concerned of what's going to happen when we open those wells back up. And so I just want to speak to some things we might think about and, and as we approach restarting and imagining getting through the sudden period and bringing wells back on and what that ramp up might look like. And then some things to consider on the operational side, what you might take advantage through this time while wells are shut in. You know, one of the things I've just experienced the most in, in these unconventional reservoirs is multidiscipline efforts are so key in this more than I've seen uh, than ever before. Um, so as we think about these approaches, whether it's operational considerations or how we restart, we're going to have to involve all facets of, of our business to approach that. And if you didn't see David Jones uh, kind of recording we talked about last week on shut-in criteria, I'd highly recommend you go pull that up and take a look. But a lot of those same considerations are going to come into play. So we're going to be thinking about the commercial aspects, um, the land, um, leases, legal, um, getting our, our production ops folks, our reservoir, our production engineers all involved in these conversations that we approach it. And the thing we need to task ourselves with the most is we're, we're reacting very quickly, but how can we get ourselves to a proactive state and how can we take time to form teams around critical pieces of this elements and really put some thought behind this because we haven't had to do this before, especially in these type plays. So we know that we're going to shut these wells in They're We're going to try and bring them back online. They're going to come back to where they were at some point producing and then probably something in between there or less. So that's the thing we want to consider is what are the things that we can do to give ourselves the best chance when we bring those wells back online. So I think the first thing we need to do is if we're imagining going back to the restart phase is let's put some just as much design test as we put into the shut in to learn as much as possible. Let's put together some thought about what we might do when we restart and the things we might consider when we restart. And so some a better practice, in my opinion, would be get a task force team together to kind of line those out and come up with some practical guidelines you can arm your operations folks with as we approach that. And I'd even pair a production engineer, a reservoir engineer, and maybe an MSO together on some routes to kind of work that together as the dynamic situation changes. And as operators approach this, what they're going to do is they're going to be chasing cash flows. They're going to want to get production on as quick as possible when we come back um, to get those cash flows going. So they're going to bring on their best wells first, their strongest wells, their highest producers, and they're going to work down that line if they shut in lower producer volumes or restarting artificial lift or those types of things. And they're going to be quickly looking at how can I create cash flows and, and minimal investment or minimal needs wells that don't come back are going to go on the work over list and it's going to be a very economic criteria about how we approach those and what kinds of things we do just trying to look at the questions here if i see anything that come up when i look over here as we go but as we as we bring those wells back on i think one of the most thought-provoking things we need to think of is just like we've been talking about in industry and choke management and how we ramp those wells back up has an impact um, to avoid things like damage that we discussed in the last webinar and what Dwayne's going to talk about in the next talk. And so I think we need to be thoughtful about how we ramp those back on, just like we pop wells after we complete them. And, and we need to see that's going to be different for different wells, depending on how much energy is stored in the reservoir. That's one thing I would want to avoid that as, as we try to ramp up back quickly and recover volumes from the shut-in is not to open wells too quickly that you can cause some sort of damage or other issues that's going to lead to um, rod tubing failures or those types of things that you're going to have a new work over. 
And so some of that would be in that test force of a better program. If you have a production engineer with pair with a reservoir engineer and a field folks looking at a route, it's going to take one set of actions to bring the well back. And then as you bring the well back and you start to see the new performance, you're going to have to baby and look at that well um, to maintain production and keep it flowing through time. So those are things that I think really help as you get that to avoid additional shut-ins issues, uh, creating additional failures and those types of things. And a lot of that's going to take time to get alignment between organizations in terms of different drivers, um, between land folks wanting to meet requirements for leases, which is what one of the things is probably very unique just in the US and not in other countries where you have those obligations, as well as those commercial things to get um, trucks or other vendors in place to, to keep the business going where they're struggling as well. And, and on some of the time, the items, if we look like through the opportunity is, can we step back from an engineering perspective and how do we take advantage of the opportunity from the shut in? So we've shut in, we see wells build pressure, then what's the next step of what we can learn? And so that's where, what can you do in terms of intermittent flow or tests as you go back and forth? Um, and some of the stuff that Trevor's gonna talk about in this webinar too is the interference testing. So how can you learn about communication or some of the other tests that you put in the ground as you re-bring on the wells and, and look at that start? Um, and so that's something I think you wanna put some thought into, how might you sequence those wells to learn the best and get some information out of that? And what could that look like as you're trying to meet um, different business objectives of returning wells of um, production or even just how you're producing wells in some sort of lower curtailed state as you are maybe intermittenting wells through production or you're choking wells back partially just to reduce volumes um, for a temporary time. And then one of the key questions I think that's going to be coming up is, is flush production and, and, and you're going to hear questions from our management. What flush can we expect and how we predict that? And the best things that can provide guidance around there is go look at, at other times when you shut in wells um, for workovers or when you had weather events or things that you had major downtime. Um, and you can see kind of a whole gamut of range. So good wells, you probably see a stronger flush production that comes back in that signature. And then poor wells, um, you may see little to no return of flush. To, and it's going to see the full gamut in that. And so really go back in that history and see what you have. And in this time, you know, the last decade we've been developing these shale plays, there's just not a significant history of significant downtime to look at, but those are some of the best things. And some of those early generation wells are going to be challenges where they had lower completion, smaller completions, fewer entry points that those wells are wells that are going to be challenged that maybe we depleted them down to some sort of lower reservoir pressure. But those are also opportunities we're looking at now in many places for refracts. And everyone's trying to learn how we go back and get those stranded resources. So that's where I was talking about last time a little bit. You might find opportunity where there seems to be quite a bit of pressure left in some of these wells, but not a lot of deliverability um, in these wells. I've also seen examples of wells where we have little white wells that we've shut in for some time for different reasons, just sort of normal things. And we, we've been able to get them back after some time. So there's a lot of discussion out there about um, capillary pressures and other effects that are going to prevent wells from coming back. Um, and, and some of that will be seen. And, and oftentimes I found we underestimate the reservoir pressure that's there. And in my experience um, through some pilots and things, I've seen data where we see differential depletion in these mile, two mile laterals with gauges installed. And so there's gonna be some interesting effects too that we'll have to learn what the repercussions are in terms of maybe cross flow because of heterogeneity or differential depletion that as you shut in the well, you're gonna have those tight, uh, very low perm, uh, high pressure areas produce into those areas where you have a much uh, higher perm and lower pressure that have produced that that'll be some of the mechanism that you see the flush when you initially, but it will be most likely very short lived. And what we would like to see is our wells go back on trend post bringing them on. And, and through this time as, as wells are shut in, it's a good time to think of kind of on the operation side maintenance things you can do. Can you go investigate tanks and, and look at flow lines and those types of things while you're down so you can actually see um, what you can actually work over and, and be ready for the ramp up as you come back. So, so if I could just kind of maybe in there and, and, and entertain some questions that come through, the biggest thing is to take time, make some task force around maybe chemical treatment programs and those things that you can preserve well integrity, and then how you might actually best approach the ramp up as you come back. So interested to hear kind of what questions are maybe on things mind, maybe aspects I didn't hit or other areas I could talk in more detail.
Nathan, I think you, you covered uh, some, some good ground there, but we do have a couple of questions. So let me, uh, let me hit you up here. Uh, the first one is, uh, is, is talking about after treating the wells with some shut-in chemicals, we regularly circulate the shut-in wells to hopefully see less damage when we bring them back on. Uh, then we analyze the samples. So in terms of operational process, can you share any procedure or guidelines on how to circulate these wells uh, that are tied to high pressure hydraulic pumps uh, to 2,500 PSI? Is that something that, uh, that you can speak to from your experience? Um, I don't know if I have enough experience on that one. That's a pretty detailed one in terms of giving a good procedure from that. Um, you, you know, you could go down and try if you want to work over things nitrogen, but I think you're just, if it's a rod pump or anything like that, you're going to have to take your time vaping the well to bring it back on and have patience that it may take time to actually see deliverability from the reservoir if things have, have been challenged or you're seeing some capillary forces. But, but this is a good question and, and some of what I think all of us are going to be challenged with. And often I find a lot of people have slowed down pumps and those types of things to maybe not have to have those wells shut in as you get through that as a procedure um, and just keep them at a lower rate instead of completely turn them off all the way. Here's another good one, I think. Uh, can, you, can you talk about some other uh, data sampling that's needed besides downhole pressure? So we're talking about you know, looking at temperature, uh, casing and, and timing integrity, um, you know, maybe downhole fluid samples. Is there, are there other uh, factors, parameters that you look at? Certainly one could grab those. I'm just, I would be reluctant that operators are going to take the time to do that um, through this period unless they had a plan there, just because that's going to be additional cost, additional run. Um, certainly you could go in and survey casing and some of those things if you're looking at refracts of wells and trying to prioritize which wells you want to go after. You know, in terms of sampling, um, do you have wells where you want to get a sample and see uh, what would GOR changes happen uh, after the shut-in? And you can, you can often get those on surface. You don't have to do those as downhole samples. Those are usually quite expensive in terms of, of data gathering. So surface sampling can be um, good enough from that if you're concerned about GOR changes. So Nathan, let me, let me get you one more question. Uh, I don't know if you had any experience with this, but, but uh, it's an interesting one. It's talking about after Harvey, um, there was a lot of shutdowns uh, in the Gulf Coast area for a hurricane a couple of years ago. Were there any uh, recommendations that you can make regarding safety before reopening, people talk about sustained casing pressure. Is that is that applicable here? Uh, yeah, I think paying attention, having some surveillance around casing pressure, those things can be good in case um, you have things eroded or come up through chokes and, and need to do some maintenance there. I've seen that happen. One of the big things I think to take away, I forgot to mention was in terms of safety is really empower on your folks in the field as they bring things on and they have lots of priorities to take time to to really revisit every facility looking for leaks and those types of things because as gaskets and other things wear out you can have some failures and it's pretty easy for uh, a minute or so just to drive by on to the next job but it take that extra time to drive around location and look for leaks and those types of things um, and some other things i think we, we noticed from harvey is uh, EOG put out a slide kind of showing how they had had some flush production from Harvey. And, and honestly, that flush production is going to be factored on many things, whether you have the infrastructure offtake to see that, your facilities, whether that capacity is there to even see that. So some of that will be bottlenecked and each play will be different depending on the, that infrastructure, whether you operate it or not. Um, if it's a third party and if they've had to shut down and you're relying on them to bring on. So many factors there, but certainly I think you'll see it in some plays and we definitely see it on a single well basis and have a history, um, but that will be base and base independent depending on some of those factors and really the limitations will be on surface. Well, Nathan, um, we're almost out of time with you, but uh, I know you're sticking around for the general Q&A and I want to remind everybody that, that you're going to get to ask your questions again if we don't get to them, but we're going to sneak in one last one for you. Uh, and this was, I was kind of wondering, you, you mentioned that you're going to have to baby these wells when they come back on, you're going to have to nurture them. So this question was uh, talking about what is the ramp up procedure recommended for bringing these wells back online? I imagine that that's pretty uh, field specific, but can you, can you talk to us about that real quick? Yeah, I mean, the way I'm imagining is, is I would come up with a choke schedule similar to what you do when you bring on new wells and identify and empower on your folks to, to, to work slowly to get back to where that well was before. Each well will be in a different state. Um, and you're going to see some different signatures. Um, and so I, I would be cautious that production folks are going to want to maximize that production, but try to work slowly back to the target that you're at, whether it's a rod pump or those things. And, 
and quickly i think you'll see some settings if you see flush production they'll they'll ramp up to pump the wells faster but then that quickly could lead to a, a, a quick failure so just be cautious about that come from an approach of how can we minimize failures and how can we gradually bring wells on um, to to avoid damage or those types of things that Dwayne will speak to some of those key elements um, next quite a bit but one other thing I, I wanted to impede on people too is, is we're going to get stuck up on looking at single wells and I think as we look at the system we need to look at the pad of wells as a system is becoming a very three-dimensional problem and how we drain wells and so we could see changes how you bring wells on in the order that you bring wells on that the, the signatures could be a little bit different because of communication between wells. So we may have to look at pads instead of individual well specific, but you know, I'm really excited for the future to see kind of papers and information we learn for this period as an industry. Okay, well, thank you, Nathan. Uh, we're gonna move on to Dwayne Purvis. Uh, Dwayne, are you with us? There yes, you indeed. Uh, Dwayne's a reservoir engineering consultant. He's also a writer, speaker, and a mentor based in Fort Worth. He showed us where he is. He's sort of like in the old town Fort Worth. So um, he's got a, a cool spot to uh, speak to us today. Dwayne, do you want to go ahead and take over? Yeah, thanks for that. Let me share my screen here. So look, when, when we go to shut in a well, um, it's actually a really, really simple process, right? It's um, a matter of turning a valve. The first question we ask is always about economics. Does it make sense? And the second question we ask is always about contracts, particularly our land contracts. Are we gonna lose the right to produce the well? Uh, the third question we ask, the third most urgent has to do with uh, mechanics of the lift and the pipe. Are we going to suffer some sort of mechanical damage? But perhaps the most consequential is the one that's the least concrete, and that's the issue of loss of reserves. There are horror stories. Well, uh, people will, will talk about um, hearing of wells that never came back to a fraction of their previous glory. But those are often, uh, and the understanding is often anecdotal, it's piecemeal. Um, a lot of the time we lack a comprehensive system to understand what the causes are. Um, and, and indeed, the causes of loss of productivity can be very diverse. Um, Farouk Savan has a book that's not it's on my desk right now, 500 pages on formation damage. This table shows a few of the, um, the themes, the categories of damage that we see. Um, sometimes it happens during closing, sometimes we lose productivity during the downtime, and sometimes on the opening. But the mechanisms change. Uh, if, we have, if we rely on a large hydraulic fracture system, if that's an essential part of the system, then there are a set of risks unique to those, to that situation, which you see here in highlight black, that are, uh, that are unique to that situation we have to pay particular attention to. Now, I will say that the damage is a subject that's a mile wide and an inch deep, which is to say we, uh, a lot of times there is no damage whatsoever, uh, but there are a lot of ways that damage can occur. Perhaps the worst, uh, although often some of the most difficult to, to quantify are uh, damage caused by chemical issues. So in the system, we have a number of components that can interact chemically and all those meet together at a, <laughs> at a time and place, at a temperature, pressure, and for a duration that can cause things to go wrong in the wrong combination of circumstances. But the largest category, the most frequent set of issues are between water that we put on the well and the rock with its conate water. And we can create emulsions, clay swelling, we can cause fine migrations, and we can cause scale. But moving around the circle, there are other ways that we can also have problems. We can interact the waters with the additives and create scale. Asphaltines can form uh, quite on their own without another interaction. Uh, emulsions can get formed between the, the waters and the oils and mixing of waters can make scales. Um, 
lots of variations, but the kingpin is the interaction between the water we put on the well and the rock and its conate water. So to, to know whether or not you might have these issues, you can look for these red flags. One, if you've seen it in operations. If you have seen issues during operations of scale or, um, or if you've seen unexplained loss of productivity, then these kinds of, it, and that's a red flag that you've got something going on in the system that creates a risk also in the reservoir. Um, a second major issue besides that uh, actual seeing some problems, hints of problems, are orthogenic clays, which is to say clays that grew on the inside of the pores. They grew in place like crystal uh, during di diagenesis of geologic time. Um, and that makes those clays very accessible to the interaction with waters and thus more, more problematic. So in general, the best thing you can do is keep on the reservoir only native fluids. Um, absent that, you need to, I'm not an expert, um, what you can do though is work with a good chemicals vendor and you can do your own lab research to understand what might happen. Um, now, when, uh, aside from chemical issues, we can have issues uh, during downtime related to fluid movement. I know this is generic to ju both conventional and uh, millidarcy or microdarcy and, and shell reservoirs. When we think about the, the reservoir and its production, we tend to focus on this one of the three forces in the reservoir, the pressure drop. But there are always three forces. The second is gravity. And on an order of magnitude, gravity is the same at distance in a conventional reservoir as the pressure drop. And then sometimes we ignore and sometimes uh, we can't have the capillary pressure, which causes water or in some cases oil to imbibe, to suck into the matrix of the rock. When we shut in the well, we shut down this one that gets the most attention. But the other two forces are completely unchanged. In fact, capillary loses a counterbalancing force. They continue to behave. And in fact, I, I didn't show pressure drop disappearing because uh, sometimes there's a little bit of pressure drop that remains. There can be backwash in and out of the well bore, or there can be cross flow between perks. Um, in a multi-layered system, you can have cross flow from the less depleted reservoir into the more depleted, or uh, it's possible from one stage in a hydraulic fracture to another stage um, because one is connected to uh, perhaps an aquifer or one is connected to another offset well that's still online. We can continue to have cross flow that makes a problem. We can also have uh, gravity issues where the, the water, the formation inside the reservoir, fluids continue to move under gravity forces. And that can cause fluids to come closer to a well bore or to go farther away from the well bore. And uh, this kind of issue, these kinds of issues are relatively easy to understand, to predict, because mostly they're related to reservoir dynamics that we're already studying and understand if we can just do that. Let me blaze through uh, the last few of my slides. And, and that, because these are the issues that are unique to uh, shale wells. The hydraulic fracture that we put on is a, the, the system. And this is meant to be a well bore and a, and a hydraulic fracture, a single hydraulic fracture. My kids were pestering me the other day, what on earth is that? They had several guesses, and uh, none of them were a well bore and a hydraulic fracture. But it's the hydraulic fracture network is very thin, very narrow. But in aggregate, it creates something absolutely essential. Because it's relatively small, it is subject to damage. And then we can lose this critical component. So during shut-in, we have as issues of stress cycling and water handling. Um, so water, remember, is less compressible than the rock itself. Now, gas is um, two to three orders of magnitude more compressible, and a little bit of gas goes a long way. 
But in general, when we shut in a well, we create a pressure surge. We've got um, fluids moving with momentum, either down in an injector or up in a producer. You shut it in and all of a sudden it backs up and creates a jolt to the pressure that goes down to the perfs. Um, when we shut in after a hydraulic fracture, we can sometimes, if the perfs are open well enough, observe the pressure response of the hydraulic fracture itself to this surge. And that opening and closing, both uh, during the, the water hammer and then the fact that we're doing it at a larger scale, can uh, create issues for the mechanical issues on the fracture itself and the profit. So we can't look we can embed or crush the profit in such a way that a hydraulic fracture becomes a little bit more narrow. And the permeability uh, is a square function of the, the area. So a little bit of loss of width goes a long way. Though the issue of shut-ins, I know we do shut-ins all the time. And lots of times I think the um, actual effect, the damage gets overlooked. There were two papers closely related on a single study by Jim Crafton, where he looked at the productivity and looked at hundreds of wells, multiple shut-ins early in time. And what he found was that systematically the wells lost productivity. And product production is not the right measure, but productivity is. The green charts here show where he's uh, wells that are shut in using a special chemical treatment to inhibit uh, capillary blocking. So that um, probably has some mechanical damage to it, whereas the, the other shorter, uh, the taller bars rather, have mitigation for capillary blocking. But what it shows is significant loss every time. Uh, second issue is during the downtime. Water sitting on the, uh, on the formation can, one, it creates a, uh, it saturates it and can create a capillary block, both in the fracture and sometimes in the reservoir. Something that we have the opportunity, but may not succeed at clearing out during the restart. Um, water that's left chronically on the, in the fracture system can cause a mechanical weakening of the fracture of walls and therefore closure. And then of course, the, the chemical issues we talked about before. Um, so th this, just a, an example of how we know that there are issues of water and capillary blocking. We've seen this in flowback. There was a time when it was considered uh, a good practice to soak a well, and we did see increased initial production, but we saw lower ultimate recovery because uh, we got the flush production, but we lost other production due to capillary blocking. Dwayne, I'm gonna hit you with the, uh, the the one minute warning. Yeah, yeah, I'm. I got too ambitious. Uh, we do have on opening. We have issues with stress dependence and blowing the water out. Removing the water is about velocity. It's not about pressure. We we want to try to optimize that with uh, get enough velocity to clear it out without damaging the reservoir. And that's a, a tough balance, especially when you've got uh, especially blowing the water out. Especially when you've got a, this kind of situation where your lift point is higher than the points in your in your fracture system. Now remember the water tends to settle at the bottom where the fracture is the thickest and it tends to be at the far edges and those are also the harder places to blow it out and it gets especially hard to blow it out when you've got um, a toe down situation. Uh, we know from choke management that there's a significant issue in many reservoirs, certainly not all, uh, with uh, pressure or stress dependent uh, permeability and that's probably the single, the single big, biggest issue. So well, you're gonna to have to understand the reservoir to understand what your risks are, because they do vary, not just between plays, but between parts of plays. We're gonna look for issues of capillary blocking and free water production, issues for loss of conductivity of the fracture system. And both of those then playing with the age of the well. Uh, an older well has less pressure and less ability to blow out uh, the water, but it also has probably accumulated more damage. So depending on how you weigh those out, it could be better or worse. Ah, <laughs> thank you for the warning, Trent. Um, any, what are you thinking? Any questions?
Yeah, th- thanks, uh, thanks, Dwayne, so much for, for the in-depth look there. I have a question for Mary Van Donnellan. Uh, I realize the shut-in time required varies by formation, but do you think that if we shut in our wells to minimize offset fracture-driven interactions, how long of a shut-in would be required to get reasonable analysis? Is it days, weeks, or months? I think the question is how we handle shut-ins for offset fracks. Um, mm-hmm. And we do, we do that as a matter of practice, but we always try to get the water off as fast as we can. The, the effects of the water on water weakening of the fracture phase is a function of time, uh, of the, the square root of time. The uh, capillary blocking, though, issue is much shorter, much faster, almost instant. Um, it's not advisable to leave water on to gather information. It's advisable to keep it off to increase productivity. Did I answer that question, Trent? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that, uh, it, it, I wonder if she can send a clarifier, but I think we're talking about, you know, that we, that we do shut, we do do these routine shut-ins and yet do we, do we, are we able to take uh, advantage of the same type of situation as what we're talking about today? Usually those can last for four or six weeks if you're doing a big infill project. Uh, and some of these shut-ins might be on the order of six weeks to two months, maybe some are longer. Yeah, the, we cert- that's cert- I, I defer that question, I think, just to someone else, but that seems to, that ought to be enough time to gather the information. One, one last thing for you, is there anything in general that we can do to sort of prevent these damage mechanisms on the front end of the process or are you pretty much up to the mercy of reservoir pressures and the dynamics? There is stuff that we can do. The, if we keep only native fluids on the reservoir, then there shouldn't be a reaction. So if we, um, if we have toe up and, or we otherwise don't saturate it with water, that ought to will help. As a general rule, uh, shutting a well in hard and fast or rocking a well, those cause me concern and opening a well up similarly with a single massive step uh, from zero to 60 uh, with one turn of the valve, that also causes me concern. Um, but it, but the, there are so many variables um, and they change not just from play to play, but within a play and often from well to well inside the play, depending on how they were treated in the past. The, the, uh, I don't know we can be, you know, Entirely. Well, one interesting thing for me, I guess, was on the formation water itself is that, you know, you're, you're having things gas out. So even that aspect of it is tricky. You can't just say my produced water is the same as, it, as the formation water. Things may have dropped out, you know, all that separation. So yeah, it's, it's a great point. The, 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 there's conate water, there's water we put on it, there's residual frac water, and sometimes we get water from another formation, from the Ellenberger producing up through the fracture system, or in a, a water flood, we may be using a low salinity, uh, a different water. Um, and all of those have their own chemistries that can make problems. That's very interesting. Well, John uh, is our next speaker. Thank you, Dwayne. John is uh, coming to us from what looks like a green electronic ocean. Um, how are, how are the, uh, how's the sailing going, John? It's going pretty good. I want to thank Darcy Fairbrother for my nice background for Zoom here. Trying to stay on brand here with the Viking ships on the water. Um, uh, for those of you that don't know, Saga and Saga Wisdom. Saga is the goddess of wisdom in Norse mythology. So you can now understand why we're going that direction. So the title of my talk is really assessing, identifying and quantifying pressure dependent productivity. I say productivity because it's not always about permeability, but we'll get into that. So some deep overpressured thoughts by yours truly. But before I get into that, let's get to know a little bit about Mr. Trent Jacobs. Uh, You all recognize him as the digital editor of the JPT, but one thing I bet you didn't know Uh, for those of you that are Netflix fans, is that he interviewed Joe Exotic uh, over 10 years ago, and he spoke with Carol Baskin when he was cutting his teeth um, as a journalist. And here you can see the the link that takes you to the article that he wrote a long, long time ago. And uh, so they've got the Tiger King, we've got the JPT King. Uh, The outline for the talk today is talking really just about stress-sensitive reservoirs for, for my piece. Uh, We'll talk about the lab tests that are done, uh, productivity loss and damage mechanisms. We want to talk about all the conceptual thinking for things that can cause damage through time. Uh, How do we model and analyze productivity loss when we look at production data? 
how do we come up with a proxy or a functional reliable way for dealing with that uh, for reservoir characterization and forecasting? And then how can we use RTA as a post-mortem tool to understand the influence of opening chokes or increasing percentage drawdown and how that could have detrimental impacts on long-term recovery featuring Haynesville, Vacamarta, and a Bakken study. So let's talk about the lab. And you know what, like I got a little help from my friend, uh, Mark McClure, who directed me to some Mark Zoback literature to really get an understanding of how things are done laboratory wise and some of the theory. But you're gonna see core tests here where they measure permeability against a variety of different X axes here. Here we look at effective pressure. Here we look at fracture perm versus confining pressure. Here's normalized frac connectivity against confinement stress. And here's Dave as an excerpt from our online RTA course, Saga Wisdom, who's referencing Zobak, who, who plots Klinkenberg corrected perm as a function of effective stress. So take a look at all the different ways that we can be getting uh, our lab results. And it can be kind of confusing about looking at this data and how do we translate that into commercial software? Um, and is there a way to do that? Well, just talking about uh, a couple of the plots here and looking at the relationship between confining pressure uh, and effective stress, uh, just a little bit of history that I didn't know, but of course, preparing for today, I, um, I try to get myself up to speed. So the, the main relationship here um, is Terzaghi's principle, which who developed the theory for effective stress way back in the 1920s. And that, that was essentially saying effective stress is equal to confining pressure minus pore pressure. Uh, fast forward to the 19, early 70s and Joram Byerly proposed an exact effective stress law, which can be taken as a generalized form of Trozaghi's principle, um, but they introduced the biot co coefficient. This biot coefficient, which is almost like less than unity, it quantifies the rock susceptibility to pore pressure. And this is really the expression where you can see the relationship of pore pressure, confining pressure and effective stress. So if you're going to show it um, one way or the other, at least you can now understand its relationship. Um, and when we look at these things, I think it's important to understand uh, that some people are looking at fracture permeability, some people are looking at core plug permeability, um, and what are the differences? Well, we can learn uh, from the world of natural fractures. My former prof, Dr. Roberto Aguilera at uh, the University of Calgary is probably one of the most famous in the field of characterizing and understanding natural fractures. And this really gets us back into those classic PTA books that you would have studied a long time ago, many of you, because most of the people on the call today are reservoir engineers. So I'm talking dual porosity, worn and root, breaking a, a reservoir down into a system of uh, natural fractures and matrix rock. And the point here is and what we've learned from natural fracture systems, the quote that I that I took from the famous Lee Rollins and Spivey SP book on pressure transient testing was that the total system KH, the total flow capacity is essentially all buried in the fractures. And they were thinking natural fractures for dual porosity. You can have the same conceptual thinking when you're trying to assign a bulk rock volume and you're saying within that rock volume, yeah, we've got a, you know, our principal hydraulic fracture, but beyond that, We've got complex fractures, reactivated natural fractures, lots of cracks and things that are really giving us the bulk of the system per permeability. And that's an important concept when we start to think about techniques that we can use in commercial software for trying to use correlations to capture degradation of, of productivity, which I'll get into here shortly. So more conceptual thinking. Dave already at last Friday's webinar, either you were on it live, hopefully you had a chance to visit the Saga Wisdom YouTube channel to hear our presentation from last Friday. But Anderson gave us a great list for wells that were already on production for all the various things that he could think about that, that could include damage through time or productivity loss through time. Um, and I won't run through the list again, it's all in front of you here, but what about damage not through time on drawdown, but what about wells that are shut in? I mean, that is the purpose for today's webinar and yesterday and last week's is to talk about all the things that we need to consider when we're talking about the great shale shut-in. Um, you know, in the April 30th JPT article with the link that's on the slide there, George King 
uh, talked about low pressured reservoirs. And I think Nathan um, also uh, made some comments earlier about you want to consider low pressure reservoirs. And I'm talking reservoirs that are now depleted, you know, below 0.3 PSI per foot as a poor pressure gradient, definitely below 0.2 PSI per foot. You're going to have problems, George King says. And so these are, these are other considerations we want to think about. Of course, I'm really focusing this talk on uh, overpressured wells that uh, where we're talking choke strategies and we have to be careful with how we flow our wells. And so getting into that, um, I've created, uh, what, what's in front of you now is uh, the correlation of permeability to pore pressure, essentially. This is what is featured in, in commercial software, as I said. This is a good functional reliable approach for capturing well performance trends during drawdown and buildup. Here we see um, an exponential relationship or decay of permeability with pressure. As we lower our pressure, the rock gets tighter. Um, and here, the, both plots are the same. It's just the plot on the right is just plotted in a semi-log plot. Uh, just so you can see the orders of magnitude of permeability decay uh, as we go from initial reservoir pressure to, um, to like a final flowing pressure or something uh, near zero, as you can see. Now the perm modulus that I'm using, which is that, that exponent that, that governs the relationship is a high value. Uh, for those of you that don't know it, four e to the minus four is very Haynesville-like. Um, and when we talk about two orders of magnitude of permeability, uh, like decay, um, that is a lot. So what we're talking about is probably what, the reason why these values work when modeling Haynesville wells, and I'm just saying ballpark numbers, is because most of the uh, system that we're dealing with are fractures. And these are, and when we look at fracture uh, decay in, as a result of stress, you're going to see that um, that's, that's similar to what we're measuring in the lab. Now, Trent asked last week, what are your thoughts on damage being reversible? Everybody across the panel said, well, yeah, no, you can't reverse the damage. And, and that's, that's true, but uh, something to keep in mind with these correlations in the software is that these are elastic um, correlations, not plastic deformation correlations. So when you shut in your well and you start building pressure back up from T1, T2, and T3, and at the well, well bore, uh, near well bore, you're watching pressure kind of come back up, the fully elastic deformation part tells us that the rock was tighter, but then it it gets its pressure back up and it goes the other way and it restores some of the permeability. So the average reservoir pressure is dropping, you can't change that. So no matter what, degradation goes the one direction. And in real life, it's not fully elastic, which is really what the comments were about. We are gonna not be able to restore things. That's called hysteresis, so that we can't get back to where we were. So in software, you usually have extra dials you can turn when you're modeling or analyzing, uh, you can think about fracture conductivity dropping through time or increasing skin damage. And those are tools and mechanisms that are available to a uh, production modeler. So how do we incorporate pressure dependent permeability into analysis and modeling? Well, we modify the pseudo pressure and for analytics, we uh, analytical work, we modify pseudo time. Taking a look at some uh, of the major plays here, which are of the major plays, those that we think clearly exhibit productivity loss through time in the well performance data? Well, these are the, the main culprits, the ones where it's the clearest that we can see these signatures. Uh, Haynesville is definitely the biggest culprit. The southern trend of the Eagleford, the dry gas window is the biggest culprit. Some Niobrara, Utica, and other parts of some liquids rich areas, some Eagleford, a little Bakken in some cases, and some Delaware Wolf Camp in some cases. But let's talk about the Haynesville. So simulating a drawdown and build up, just simulating data, this isn't real, but using res, uh, Haynesville properties, just taking a look at drawdown and build up response and what we can do from that. Um, this was published in the paper, um, an SP paper, the, my first paper that was written uh, back in 2010, when the Haynesville was really booming. So the, the point here is that when we look at simulated data or real field data, if you looked at wells that have a high IP rate and sharp decline rate, it sure looks like boundary dominated flow and that you'd be only contacting a very small resource in place, in this case, 1.4 BCF for an OGIP. 
But when you shut in the well and build it up, that buildup pressure tells you you're dealing with a much bigger reservoir. Um, Dave Anderson in his talk um, and in a video that I'm about to show you, shows you how you can model drawdown data if you didn't have that shut in and that, that beautiful buildup data to tell you what's going on. You may in the top picture here, the top figure, have a perfect history match of your data that matches drawdown, but it tells you you've got a small reservoir and that under predicts uh, what you've contacted and what's down there and obviously under predicts your reserves. Or you could match the top of the buildup, but not really greatly match anything. But if you turn on this pressure dependent permeability uh, that I uh, showed you previously, you can get the whole thing. So here's a, an excerpt from a, a blatant plug from our software just to expose the audience to what we're doing as a startup company. We do do digital online training. Uh, this is Dave uh, in chapter five of his online RTA course to, to take you through his uh, procedure in commercial software. In this case, this is the IHS market Harmony Enterprise software, uh, I believe. And Dave is modeling the entire uh, production data uh, from, from start to end. And he's turning on geomechanical and he walks you through a workflow for how to do that. Getting back to uh, the signatures that we could see in the Haynesville, uh, again, this is the simulated data, but we see it in, in real uh, life, is uh, something that looks very much like boundary dominated flow, whether it's a specialized plot or a log log plot, a hookup on a square root time plot, most people think, oh, productivity loss. But in fact, this was simulated with infinite acting linear flow, just like all shale gas wells are supposed to exhibit, like Barnett and Woodford, Marcellus, big, nice straight lines for years uh, on the square root time plot. But if you increase drawdown or impose effective stress and you have some geomechanical effects, it can sure look like you're draining a small tank. Uh, of course, because I introduced to you uh, the way that we can um, account for pressure dependency in the pseudo pressure uh, formulation, we can make that go away with a superposition time function and uh, a modified pseudo pressure. So we can handle it. Now, Dr. Chris Clarkson introduced a few years ago, not just accounting for the geomechanical effects, but also the multi-phase flow consideration effects, accounting for condensate dropout, accounting for water, especially for those Delaware Wolf Camp players where water is a big issue. So multi-phase environments need some corrections for the analytics. And so that's all being introduced here. Uh, my buddy Dilhan Ilk did some really great work uh, in 2011. And his focus was talking about effective stress fields, essentially saying it's not one permeability modulus to govern uh, the reservoir. There's more to it than that. There's also how you operate the well. So do you have a high drawdown uh, or do you have rate restricted and low control drawdown? So he's saying that different permeability decay functions uh, should consider different drawdown scenarios. And so the higher drawdown scenario imposes greater effective stress and with more stress, you get lower long-term recovery. In his example, his simulator uh, suggested a 28% difference between two drawdown scenarios when it came to long-term recovery. So that was really great. Uh, transitioning now to the Vaca Muerta, Vaca Vaca Vaca, we've got ourselves uh, a plot here that shows in the lab another one of these core tests where, or fracture tests where we're measuring uh, the drop in fracture conductivity with confinement stress. Uh, so this is a play where we see it as well. Um, and you can see production modeling of this data without turning on any type of pressure dependent permeability or turning that dial on and tinkering with it, you can get a much better match of the entire performance history. Uh, this is a reference from our 2017 paper co-authored with YPF and McDaniel and Associates, or Tech 2688-694. A second example, this one I really, really like. Uh, this is how you can use RTA as a post-mortem tool to quantify the impact of opening chokes on performance uh, and productivity. Watch, uh, watch how this one evolves as we open the choke. The 864th choke has a straight line here. The straight line, of course, indicates the uh, cross-sectional area to flow. But as we open the choke, we increase the stress and the slope starts to shift up and that means that we're losing frac area because it's on the denominator of the slope equation um, and we keep opening the choke and we keep losing productivity so i would suggest this is all linear flow 
but we're losing that frac area. We're losing conductivity to such a degree that the frac area has gone um, and that it's no longer effective uh, or, um, to, to the distances and to the areas that it was before. Now, what about the Bakken? Uh, this is sort of a, a play that I have mixed feelings with. Dave Anderson uh, had shown a, a pres like a, an example of where there was likely some geomechanical effects. Other very famous authors in the field of refrac, uh, Mike Vincent has, has publicly disclosed or made announcements that there's so much evidence that the Bakken frac jobs heal or close over time. As an RTA guy, I say that I've, I've looked at about 100 of these wells, production modeling in them, and some, yes, I'll absolutely say there could be some geomechanical, but um, for the most part, I can model all these wells with static reservoir descriptions or constant frac properties, constant conductivity, constant area, and I have no problem matching years of production data sets. And the hookup that we see going on here, um, I would suggest, isn't like frac degradation and conductivity losses through time. It's the expected transition in flow regimes that we get when we're dealing with higher permeability plays that are being chased by multi-frac horizontal well frac geometries, uh, along with consideration for multi-phase. So you, these transitions in these shapes aren't all about losing frac conductivity. Um, there, there's other considerations. And I, I, the, the best way to really get to the bottom of this is of course shut in the well and build up the data, get a gauge down there, and that build up data will tell us once and for all if in fact we're dealing with productivity loss. So I, I'd be really excited to, to get to the bottom of this with some of these plays that are out there. So I'll end with my deep thoughts. So another old reference from Saturday Night Live. I sometimes wonder why vendors of ceramic propens spend so much time measuring frac conductivities in the lab but never consider conducting low-cost flow and build-up tests to validate this in the reservoir. Uh, and Dylan has provided a good uh, reference here to characterize KFWs from bilinear flow. Anyway, maybe that'll happen when oil price drops to zero and operators have to shut in their wells. That'll never happen. So thank you very much, uh, and I'm ready to take your questions now. Hey, thanks so much, John, for that. Uh, we do have a few questions that uh, have come in. And uh, okay, uh, this is from William Rucker. As part of a pressure transient analysis test for well communication, we would like to have strong and consistent pressure signals. Can you talk about balancing choke schedules and ramp up against the desire to create clearly interpretable pressure transients? This is sort of an operational question, but do you think that this would make a difference in the analysis side? Yeah, I mean, it's very important that we have enough of a continued or sustained uh, segment of production where, where we can interpret it. In fact, maybe I'll share my screen again, uh, just because in that vacuum huerta example, I think it does a good, uh, as, I, as I back it up, just a moment. So here, would you say that that's enough data to extract like a reasonable slope? Um, no, not necessarily. Um, you know, we're, we're, we don't really have a good long section of data here. We start to get nice long stretch of continual, continuous data where we can be better interpret. So that's part of it. The other part is just getting good quality data. Uh, wellhead data on liquids rich wells isn't, isn't the greatest. Downhole pressures are what we're looking for. The question uh, is, is, I think is complicated. I, I don't have very clear answers. I just wanted to mention that, of course, um, if, if you're trying to do analysis or modeling of data, uh, lots of continuous changes very quickly make, make our lives very difficult to understand what's going on. So uh, as far as like how long is long enough is, is debatable. And it, it's a function of, uh, you know, obviously data quality. As far as resolution goes, uh, when we're looking at uh, daily data, I would suggest that's probably good enough if we're doing production analysis, uh, but if we're doing like shut in and build up, you'd want higher resolution. Okay, I got one more for you, John. Uh, uh, pressure dependent perm is a state function, not path function. Do you think getting from point A, high pressure to point B, low pressure through different pathways, uh, aggressive production versus moderate production makes any difference here, um, specifically regarding cumulative production? 
Okay, so that's interesting. So when I think of aggressive, not aggressive, I think of drawdown. Like, are we gonna yank it out quickly or not? And that's about effective stress fields. As far as about overall cumulative production, well, now we're talking about uh, like more, more cum is, is a greater reduction of the average reservoir pressure. Um, ab absolutely, like a drop in average reservoir pressure is going to like assuming these correlations and what we've seen in the 11 years uh, of field data for plays like the Haynesville, if, if from what we can learn is, yeah, absolutely. There's no way, first off, let me say, there's no way we can mitigate productivity loss and stress sensitive environments completely. Um, if we operate them with wide open chokes, uh, we can have damage to long-term performance. I believe that, I've seen that in the data. Um, and a, an overall pressure reduction in a reservoir when we cue more is, is an, an absolute certainty and, and a reality we have to live with. I will say this though, that even though mitigating the loss is unavoidable and the pathway that we go to get there uh, can influence things, I believe that um, the final, reaching the final condition is still going to result in damage. Uh, but if you slow it down and you reduce the effect of stress from hitting it so hard, um, then that stress uh, is less because you, you give that well choked back a longer time to sort of to, to, to establish its production, to get its production volumes out, and then it, it, it doesn't get that incredible stress so quickly. Well, John, thanks for that. I think that we're going to have to move on in the interest of time here. Sure. Uh, for folks watching, if, if the, the next presentation might go a little bit long, but I think it's going to be worth your while. Trevor Engel is a senior completion engineer at Devon Energy. He's going to be talking to us about interference testing to optimize development. Uh, Trevor, you want to turn your microphone on and... Uh... Okay, thanks Trent. Well, I'm excited to talk to everyone about interference testing today. Uh, a brief outline going to start by talking about the objectives we have internally with interference testing. I'll quickly run through a couple options that we have to conduct these tests, uh, what we focus on internally, and how to design and analyze that data. And I'm going to try and wrap it up with a couple quick case studies. Uh, I'll try and speed this up a little bit. That way we can get to some Q&A. Um, but given the time constraints, I don't anticipate that anyone will leave this uh, discussion an expert, but I am hoping that I can provide enough information uh, to show everyone the value that you can get from interference testing and hopefully how you can uh, add value to your assets. So the first thing we'll start with is, is talking about the purpose or objective. And uh, this is important because, you know, within interference testing, our, our true objective is to understand the, the connectivity or the communication between various infill wells. In a high permeability reservoir, that may be dependent on watching a transient or a signal through the matrix from widely spaced wells and, and using RTA or pressure transient approaches. However, Devon is primarily focused on low permeability or ultra tight uh, reservoirs where we're deploying multi-frac horizontal wells to extract our, our hydrocarbon. And in that environment, the overlapping fracture system is really what's driving the connectivity. And so I've got a simple image to try and highlight what I'm describing there. And, and what it's showing is that we're, we're gonna have variable fracture dimensions along the well bore. Some of these are gonna be overlapping with the, the neighboring well and some might not be. This is a very simplistic example. And in reality, we're gonna have varying degrees of connectivity from propped and conductive fractures, maybe fractures that are overlapping, but are only hydraulic and filled media. And then the presence of natural fractures may influence this. And, and what we're really looking to do is quantify the connectivity between infill wells that's driven by this overlap and fracture system. And that's our goal within Devon. And you can imagine that as we obtain interference tests and, and ultimately describe that connectivity, that it can add value to well spacing, completions volume, uh, understanding stack stagger patterns, and I'm hoping you'll get a sense for that today when we go through some of the case studies. We wanted to briefly start by illustrating a couple of the interference testing options that are out there, and I'm going to try and speed this slide up uh, and really focus on two examples we've used the most widely within Devon and that I've seen used from my peers in the industry. One is what we would refer to as 
uh, a production or rate transient test. And that's where our initial infill flowing uh, conditions are from all wells uh, that are flowing, shown here in the green. And the way we're going to create the transient or the signal is by shutting in a source well. Now, we're going to have to try and monitor that signal from these flowing wells. And because these wells are flowing, we're, to understand the signal, we're going to have to capture both rate, understand the uplift and rate we see, but also any pressure support that we feel. In our experience, the signal is too small to truly pick up the magnitude of the connectivity between these wells. And we get really low signal to noise ratios because that the monitoring wells flowing conditions really dominate that behavior. Uh, the other challenge we've seen is we're primarily in volatile oil and oil windows across our assets. And it's very difficult to get instantaneous liquid measurements that are accurate and illustrate that production uplift. And we've seen in some instances that this leads to false negatives. There are some benefits though, where we typically use this is if we have wells that are shut in for facilities or workovers, et cetera, and be more opportunistic. Where we focus our energy and efforts from an interference testing standpoint and are intentional about capturing data is on the pressure transient side. The initial conditions for a test like this is going to be all shut-in wells. And we'll talk more about that on the next slide. The way we're gonna create the transient is by sequencing a well online. That drawdown created in this well, if we have connectivity, will uh, be felt and observed at our monitor wells. And our monitor wells remain shut-in. Because these wells are shut in, this is going to be a pressure only analysis or pressure transient test. And because of that, we, we do recommend downhole gauges. Uh, this does require some increased planning. Uh, and when you think about downhole gauges, you may think that that's cost prohibitive, but we found it very cost effective. Our, our desired uh, implementation is a memory gauge and a side pocket mandrel of tubing whether that's installed up front or, or after the well's produced for some time. And uh, typically our interference tests can be conducted within a well for less than $10,000 on the downhole gauge, which we found uh, is well worth the, the data we collect. The, the benefit of getting that downhole pressure data and, and having a pressure transient test is at such higher resolution. And you can truly get improved characterization of that fracture overlap. And I don't have time to walk through Dave's analogy here, but I think the analogy he provided in the fundamentals discussion in the first webinar uh, is a perfect uh, fit for the way we're thinking about these two different interference tests within Devon. <clears throat> so I'd like to dive deeper into the pressure transient tests because that's what we're focused on within Devon and, and where I think we've seen the most value. And I'll reference that I don't have time to dive into all of the details uh, or make you an expert, give you all the tips and tricks, but there are some incredible resources out there for your benefit that we found incredibly helpful uh, in developing this technique and skill set within Devon. Uh, that's the, uh, what we consider the Chow Pressure Group paper from, uh, it's a SPE 191407. It was published by Pioneer and it's an incredible resource for you that walks through a lot of what we'll talk about today. And I'd like to, to give a, a thanks and appreciation for them for helping advance us on this topic. But like I mentioned, we're gonna start with a shut-in well, uh, all of our infills, and that's useful for the discussion today because many of us in this environment are experiencing units that we've already shut in or are planning to shut in and, and that sets itself up very well to collect some of this interference testing data with pressure transient tests. Now I'll mention it does not matter if you have a gauge downhole prior to the wells being shut in. So if you already have a field or units that are shut in, you can run the gauge after the fact and still get good data. I'm showing here an actual example within Devon where we've produced a unit for some period of time shut the entire unit in and I'll walk through how to analyze that data. We're going to start with the downhole gauge as we've talked about previously and I'm showing that uh, with the gray symbol here. 
And the first thing we're going to look for is, is that buildup. Because this well is produced and shut in, we're going to have a good, clean buildup signature. And as quickly as that well's buildup has stabilized and we feel like we're really seeing the reservoir signal, that's early enough to begin starting the test. You can see here about 24 hours after having that gauge down hole. At that point, we're going to try and forecast or project that pressure trend. Once we've done that and we feel confident in that production, projection, we can start sequencing strategically wells online to create those transients that are going to help us quantify the interference. I'm showing that here on this graph, and if we have connectivity between these wells, our monitor well and specifically the pressure uh, gauge is going to fill that, and we're going to have a deviation from this expected pressure buildup trend. It's this deviation, or what we'd refer to as the interference delta P, that we use to quantify and get a single value that describes the connectivity between these horizontal wells. As published in this Pioneer paper, uh, we're using the, the CPG equation, which is just this delta P through time for every data point divided by two times the derivative of that delta P. And a quick visual of what that may look like is shown here, where the delta P through time and the derivative are allowing us to calculate this CPG. And you can see that you're gonna have some oscillation because of a derivative on raw fill data. And what we're looking to do is obtain a single value that describes the magnitude of pressure interference. And we're using that term to be consistent with their publication. So hopefully this gives you a feel quickly for how to analyze that data. I'd like to end with a couple of comments and tips. Uh, based on fill data we've observed, but also some of the references within the Pioneer publication. You can expect your CPG values shown here in green to range between zero and one. That's based on our field data and Pioneer has a good reference there also. So it almost behaves as an index to give you a relative understanding for the connectivity between wells and how that changes. A couple last tips would be, these are really short duration tests. You can see here that to get this interference test, uh, it only took 48 hours, a little bit less, and that was to watch the buildup and observe the interference. It doesn't take very long because we're dealing with high conductivity fractures and we can feel and see those transients so quickly and describe that system. The last thing I would give you is it's very important when you sequence a well online to make sure it has stable and consistent flowing conditions. If you're bumping the chokes in this well or if it's loading up and dying and then you're bringing it back online, that's going to create multiple transients in the system that are much harder to interpret and analyze. Next, I would like to go through a couple case studies and I'm hoping that this gives you a sense for the value uh, of the data and collecting it and, and what you may be able to do in your asset areas. These Case studies are from a, a wide range of basins across uh, Devon's portfolio and range across pressure gradients between 0.5 to 0.85, uh, typically in the oil vault to oil window and a wide range of geologic settings. And so hopefully that gives you a little context for, for where this data has been collected. In this first example, I'd like to highlight how you can use interference testing to assess uh, staggered development. And the way we did that uh, within this pilot was to uh, develop, co-develop a particular zone that we knew was uh, high quality targets. We had seen successful co-development up to that point, uh, knew the performance, expected economics. The thing we were less certain about was the lateral and vertical drainage. We had another zone above that was, wasn't as far along in the development phase. And at that time though, we did have successful parent wells that illustrated good performance and economics, and we were interested in understanding whether it could be co-developed. Obviously the vertical drainage in that scenario will be important. A question we asked ourselves is, is this appraisal zone successful? Because on a standalone basis, it is draining some of this high quality reservoir below it. So, we conducted an interference test by placing a gauge on this middle landing zone. This was done after this unit had been producing for about four months 
and we shut all the wells in, let the system build up, and then we're looking to capture that interference data. You can see the buildup pressure on this monitoring well, and you can see our projection. What we did next was open the appraisal well online, sequence it online, and watch at our monitor well. And you can see that we didn't have any deviation from that prior trend, which indicates zero connectivity between these benches that are only 90 feet apart. Conversely, we sequenced this well online to understand how well connected these zones were that are the same vertical distance, and we had more of a moderate response or a magnitude pressure interference of 0.46. Hopefully this really quick example highlights some of the value you can get from this. And for us, it helps calibrate frac models. We're looking at conductivity cutoffs that it may take to illustrate the type of fracture propagation and conductive dimensions that we're describing here. It helps refine the contacted oil in place for this appraisal zone and better assess the sweet spot of that zone across the field. A couple other considerations we had are listed. Uh, and another question would be if there's just additional risk with this landing zone because it's not as far along in the development phase, could we defer it and develop it independently at a later date because we don't expect a lot of connectivity. So these are all ways we're trying to use this data. <clears throat> John talked a lot about pressure dependent properties and how that may influence a well's performance, behavior throughout the life of it. And I'll very quickly illustrate that you can use interference testing as a way to understand and collect fill data that describes how sensitive your reservoirs are to those stress dependent properties. Here is an example of a downhole gauge uh, through time. It was a permanent install and we took a test at, uh, at time zero right before uh, the wells are, are brought online. So now we're sequencing wells online at the flow back and watching that deviation that you can see here. About two and a half to three months in, we shut in the unit, did a buildup, and then conducted another interference test to see how that connectivity has changed. And what we saw from test one to test two was a quite significant reduction in the amount of connectivity or the magnitude pressure interference of about 40%. Uh, this was over the course of about three months, but another way we like to think about it, and I think John illustrated very well with some of those lab tests, is how is our connectivity degrading as a function of net effective stress that's being applied on our fracture system? I'll reference that this was from a reservoir that was greater than 0.75 PSI per foot, where we thought uh, effective stress acting on our fracture system could cause uh, fracture degradation through time. So this is a way to get some field data to validate those types of lab tests. The last case study that I'll, that I'll leave you with is actually from multiple tests. The last two show what you can do with a single data point and, and they were more simple in nature. The, the next study was we actually collected multiple interference tests on varying units around our development field that had different well spacings, completion designs, landing zone techniques to understand how a larger data set may help us understand the and integrate uh, those variables. One of the really interesting observations that we found was that the more connectivity we had or the, the increase in magnitude of pressure interference actually led to increased oil recovery. And this made a lot of physical sense to us because as we increase the amount of fracture overlap we have in the system, we're going to have less bypass pay that are between the tips of the fractures and have a more efficient drainage system. With this in mind, we asked ourselves, could we go into some units where we had a common well spacing adjust our completion design on a prop per cluster basis to try and enhance the amount of uh, flowing conductive fracture surface area we have and will that indeed influence the amount of connectivity we see. Again, all of these units were at a common wall spacing and I'm showing a simplified map here of where those units were relative, relative to each other within these township and range boundaries. We ended up testing up to two times the profit volume on a per cluster basis. 
what we found was that as we increased profit volume, it did in fact increase our flowing conductive dimensions and did lead to an increase in the magnitude pressure interference or the connectivity between these wells. And you can see that shown here, uh, up to two times uh, the profit volume. Of course, this isn't the end all be all, right? We have to assess the performance of these wells and four to five months after all of these units had been flowing, performance was better understood. We, we took a look at the EURs to understand if this uh, increase in connectivity led to increased performance. And in fact, that's what we saw. Showing that in a color scale here, where blue is lower EURs and red is increasing EURs, you can see that as we increase profit volume and connectivity between these wells, we actually saw an increase in performance. We didn't stop there because this data set provided some really interesting behavior as it relates to potentially diminishing returns of that profit volume. And that helps us start to assess and understand where we may choose to quit adding volume because the incremental oil isn't worth the cost. So this has kind of built a framework for us on how to tie well spacing completions design parameters together to understand the combination of those two that maximizes unit development. With that, I'll, I'll leave you with the summary slide. Uh, won't go through all of it, but within Devon, we found interference testing to be very valuable. And now's a perfect time and opportunity to conduct some of these tests as you can do it uh, with these units that you're having to shut in anyway. It's a cost effective way to understand your completions, well spacing and add value to your assets. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs> Trevor, thanks for that really in-depth quality look at, uh, at what you guys are working on. Uh, just as a point of clarification for everybody, can you can you speak to us um, about these uh, inter uh, interference tests and if you did this across you know, basins in your portfolio? And then can you also sort of unpack for us uh, the child pressure group range between them? And for those that aren't familiar, you know how the, how that metric works? Yeah, I'll take a stab at that, Trent. So with currently uh, across Devon, we've tested it in, in all four of our major basins, uh, which would be the Powder River Basin and the Rockies, the Stack in Western Oklahoma, and the Merrimack in the South Texas, Eagleford, DeWitt County, and also in various benches in the Delaware Basin. Uh, we've seen uh, consistent results as it relates to getting data that helps us understand what's going on, the physics, the dynamics between, uh, as I've discussed here consistently. That said, you may not expect to be able to translate the actual CPG values you get from one basin to the other. Uh, but I think to this point, we've got over 20 development, like drilling spacing units that we've collected this data on and probably upwards of almost 100 well pair interference tests that we've analyzed uh, in, in those four major basins. And then can you also just talk to us a little bit about, you know, how useful the, the CPG is as a metric? I, you know, when I was first introduced to this, it was sort of used as a uh, way to gauge the magnitude of uh, fracture driven interaction, uh, you know, impact on production. But and, and this interference test, you know, how reliable um, is it? Is it just as reliable? Yeah, so, you know, we've, we found a, a lot of value in it. You know, I referenced the range that we've seen from field data is between zero and one for an actual CPG value or, or what we would refer to in Pioneer as the magnitude pressure interference. And that is almost made it easier because we can almost use it as an index, right? It's almost like between a zero and one, you're increasing or decreasing the relative communication between wells. And that's given us the ability to quantify it. Uh, yeah, as compared to some of the other techniques, uh, we found that this is the, the most robust in terms of giving you a single value that consistently describes the, the magnitude of interference between wells, where things like production sharing or the rate transient approaches are more qualitative and binary in nature based on our experiences. Let me ask you one interesting question. Uh, how, how do you interference along a long lateral. So, um, you know, is there a way to know which uh, portions of the well are 
connected to others? Can you get that spatial awareness or um, is that not possible? So that's something we talked about internally. I don't have any data to um, share or highlight as we have not executed anything like that. Some of the things we've talked about are potentially running a dip in fiber in, in the wells that have been completed and that you're considering interference testings on. You know, there are several vendors that have really progressed the dip in fiber technology. And we've discussed using that as an opportunity that when you're sequencing a well online to be able to, to see and identify some of the responses more to fracture or along the well bore, uh, but don't have any data to, to share, but definitely an area that we're going to continue investigating and trying to progress as I'm sure others in the industry might be as well. What about when you're looking at this from the pad point of view, as opposed to a single well analysis? Um, you know, the end, the end game is you want to maximize recovery. And if interference is not a bad thing, it might improve ultimate recovery. So how do you make that sort of judgment when you're looking at the data? That's a great question. I think this data set uh, that I showed for the stack and as we collected it uh, across the Delaware, the Eagleford and the Rockies, we've seen some consistencies and it's led us to believe that, uh, you know, I, I think as we've discussed it uh, among reservoir and completion engineers in the past, if you ask someone, you know, how much interference do you need? People would typically say, well, you, you want your fractures to communicate a little bit so you don't have so much bypass resource, but you probably don't want them too well connected. I think we've consistently seen across our basins that uh, we want to achieve the highest level of connectivity we can at the combination of well spacing and completion design that has the lowest drilling spacing unit cost because that's when we'll maximize our investment. We'll get the most out for the least amount of money. And so when we're collecting this data, we're trying to ask ourselves, how can we increase the connectivity between wells, increase ultimate recovery, but do it at the lowest cost possible. Uh, what well spacing completion design really give us that? Let me ask you this one. So a lot of this, this case history is from shut-ins during infill development, right? Correct. And so, so compare that to what we're facing now. Are there, are there, is there any difference you're looking at in longer duration shut-ins that you might get uh, uh, a better analysis out of versus the, uh, the, the shorter term infill shut-ins? So as it relates specifically to getting good data for the interference test, we haven't found that additional data significantly enhances what you're able to do with it because those transients are moving so quickly. I think the thing I would point you to is to some of the work that Dwayne, Dave, and Dylan went through on the pressure buildups, then even in John's talk, where at, if you're collecting longer term buildup profiles and analyzing those, that it can help you with other characterizations of your fracture dimensions, your reservoir quality, the amount of skin you have, uh, stress dependent property. So I think the combination of those as Dwayne, I think did a really good job of provide you different perspectives that help you put it all together. But as it relates to the interference testing specifically, we haven't found that additional time really enhances that quality. And, and one last question for you before we sort of wrap this all up, and this is sort of a clarification. And for the folks that aren't familiar with TPG or Chow Pressure Group, I put some links into the uh, webinar chat, uh, the paper and the original paper that you can go access and download. Um, but uh, just as a clarification, uh, your comments were inferring that your study shows that you when you estimate higher CPG, you also experience better wells. Um, and this takes into account normalizing for matrix matrix rock quality and well spacing. Is that is that right? That's correct. I, the thing I would reference, uh, and I think the Pioneer publication did a good job of, and we've also seen, is that if you're if you're increasing well spacing, let's say for instance going from six wells per section to twelve wells per section, you're likely going to see an increase in the connectivity. Um, and that may not lead to an increase in per well results because each individual well is now draining less. You've likely increased the overall unit recovery. I think where we've seen the most benefit for this is trying to maximize per well results at some well spacing and adjusting the completion design. But we have seen it tied to, yes, performance um, consistently, and that's something we're typically focused on. 
Okay, Trevor, well, thanks again so much for your presentation and answering all those questions. Yeah, I wanted to, to, to talk about, uh, ask, I'll throw one general one out there. What is a good sample size um, uh, for people to be thinking about if we're, if we're telling everybody, you know, uh, go and, and look at downhole gauges, um, you know, what's a ratio uh, for your field to how many installations would you want to have in a blue sky uh, situation? So maybe, you know, Trevor, Nathan, you guys can kick that one off and anybody else can join in. Thanks for that, Trent. Um, so, you know, first, and, and everyone in the audience probably is aware, but it's going to depend on your objective. If you're in an appraisal phase where you're trying to answer a lot of questions, I would say you would likely need a higher percentage uh, of, of wells to get downhole pressure data on. I think as you get into development mode and optimization, you're likely only going to need that data as you're considering adjusting key variables such as well spacing, completion design. Frankly, we're always doing that, right? We're always trying to optimize. We're always trying to learn. I would say, you know, within Devon and within the last six months, we've probably conducted interference tests with downhole gauges on nearly half of our units that are in development phase. That's across our organization. And I'm Kind of being broad there, but I would say almost half of our units in the last six months uh, we've conducted interference tests on. And as we're learning so quickly, that will likely start to taper off as we have fewer questions to answer. Nathan, I'm not sure if you want to provide any perspective you may have. So, you know, in terms of that, I think it's more on where you think you have data that you can learn from it to change a decision. And so, I would actually focus on where you have the highest data that you've done some pilots experiments like Trevor was showing to actually better enhance that data or see how things have changed through time. Uh, that's the most impactful thing I think is not only that early communication, but the late communication and maybe put that in some strategic points in different GSAs or something like that and see if it's significantly different from the others. I think it'd be very hard for operators to, to get that many gauges and reacting in this manner, and then also trying to get the interference test depending on the levels that they want to curtail. So I think we're gonna have to be more purposeful and pick those and choosy. And then you can use um, other samples where you have downhole gauges or things as a, as, a, as a compare and contrast, or even surface gauges just to compare any other additional insights. You'll miss some of the, the reservoir signatures of things if you're using surface gauges, but you might get some insights that are helpful and interesting um, to look forward to. Let me ask another one for all the panelists. Um, so with regards to multi-phase flow, is this important to understand your interference test? Um, so, you know, do we, do we need to employ some correlations here? Dwayne, you were chuckling. So do you have a thought there? Yes, multi-phase flow is always, uh, always an issue, but we have some techniques that um, can do it a simulator can handle multiple place flow better than RTA can, but but the same techniques that we use to interpret RTA um, with during multi phase flow can, should be able to show inter um, interference to the extent that that uh, it can in total. But uh, John, what do you think about that? Yeah, no, I agree. Um, I would I would just add that uh, there are practical numerical models that are available in commercial software that goes under the umbrella of what people now refer to as RTA, not just the analysis, but the hybrid production models, these really high, uh, super efficient things so that you don't have to get into the super rigorous space of production simulation. And yeah, those things, those things can accommodate multi-phase flow, geomechanical effects, and all the necessary things that we would need. Uh, when we're trying to assess pressure interference. Uh, said that, there, there's the whole single well versus multi-well problem, and um, some commercial tools are better equipped at multi-well problems. Yeah, it's a great point, John, and I would second that, that you, people shouldn't be afraid of running a simulator on these wells, uh, especially the ones that are integrated part and parcel with uh, some of these software systems. Um, but of course, you know, even in the presence of multi-phase, Trevor, this is the stuff you did with Chow Pressure Group. Um, when we're looking at the primary hydrocarbon phase and we're looking at turning wells back on and watching those wells uh, come off the, the previous trend they were on and then they get corrected and quantifying that delta, um, you know, that, that's in a multi-phase environment. And those techniques are being used by Pioneer and the Wolf Camp, Devin, and all the plays Trevor would have said. So 
um, they're, they're working very well in those complex environments. I got an interesting one that I really like. And uh, so this is for everybody, uh, especially for the operators. So in your experience, uh, do the results from these interference tests actually impact uh, field development um, and how you develop your section? So uh, simply put, uh, are you, have you ever changed anything because of this data? Yeah, it's a great question and, and one our managers like to ask us a lot, right? Making sure that we're leveraging the, the data we're collecting. And uh, simply put, yes, we are. Um, from the case studies I, I tried to highlight, um, those were things we've learned and, and that we're now implementing. And in, in, especially in the case study I highlighted there at the end where we had multiple interference tests to understand the relationship between uh, completion volume and performance, we've specifically built out a more robust model that's allowed us to, what we feel, start to optimize that volume. And as things like price change, well spacing change, we're trying to lean and leverage that data to help influence decisions. And I would just add, you know, no data, no one data set is the end all be all. And I think that's the same with interference testing or with the pressure buildup, right? And I think Dwayne highlighted it really well in the first talk, gives us multiple perspectives that, and it's our you know, challenge as engineers to have to put that all together and make recommendations to assess uh, you know, future adjustments to development that'll improve asset value. Uh, but I think personally, interference tests have been an integral part of that um, within several of our asset teams here at Devon. Yeah, I've seen several instances where we've changed to spacing and completion decisions based off interference. And uh, the one thing I'm always very cautious about is that early uh, communication and pressure interaction because I just view it as a man-made hydraulically fractured system and we're going to see connectivity. So as Trevor showed, doing that again down line and measuring after some production time, how has that changed as we're seeing more of the drain rock volume than the stimulator rock volume? So it takes time to do that and you're going to have to do multiple shut-ins and build-ups and interference tests to really see that. So I'm always very cautious with initial things and I think there's a lot of um, debate about how much to use pressure and even seeing it come through the questions as the indicator performance. But as Trevor alluded, it's tying multiple pieces of information together to give you an idea of what that drainage could be, how that drainage is changing through time, and then make different predictions as to how you might change the completion or the spacing. Well, folks, if nobody has anything else, I think we're going to wrap it up. We're a little bit over time, but I'm going to, before I uh, uh, do that, we're going to toss it back to John Thompson. Uh, who's going to uh, lead us out of this great discussion. Thank you, everybody. Terrific. Uh, thanks, Trent. And this wraps up our two-part series. Uh, I wanted to make a special thank you to Trent Jacobs. You did an amazing job, as you always do. I really appreciate your support and help with this. Along with all the panelists and everybody who tuned in, we really appreciate the time and support and the amazing questions that you've been posing. We can tell you come from strong backgrounds, experienced backgrounds. I wanted to let you know that in the chat room, I've already put the link to the Saga Wisdom YouTube channel where you'll find part one and part two of our two part series that's posted. First part's up there already if you didn't already know and we'll get the next one out as quickly as possible. Uh, feel free to circulate that link to anybody in your networks that you think would benefit from hearing some of the messages that were shared with you uh, these last two Fridays. So thank you very much and thank you to RDS uh, for approaching us to come up with the idea, the great idea of capitalizing on the timing of this opportunity to, uh, to share some technical learnings and some ideas. Uh, so thanks, Rebecca. And uh, thanks again to Angie Fenton and the Women in Hydraulic Fracturing for helping us set up. So uh, take care. We hope to hear from you soon. And uh, thank you very much. Good thanks luck with everybody. analysis. <laughs> Talk to you.